tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Hello everyone, I'm back, fit as a fiddle. What's my secret you ask? Proper diet, sober living, and a good wholesome lifestyle. Avoid all three of those and you're good to go. Sorry boy, we're all out of leftovers. Oh yeah, Chinese food helps too. I'm no dummy. Come on in, friend. I don't care what you got. I'm bulletproof. Mmm. That's better. Alright, so tonight we're joined by Brian Asbury. You might remember him from Season 2, Episode 12, White Coat Syndrome. Remember when the guy's pigs ate him? <sighs> well, he's back to warm your cockles once again. So smoke them if you've got them and drink those glasses to the bottom, y'all. Cause old Drew Blood has a tell to tell. Hey, you're listening to the standard edition of this program. To get instant access to ad-free versions of all our episodes and hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu. Sign up today. It's a great way to show your support, and you'll get a whole lot for it. And authors, send your scary stories to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If you're selected, you'll get that full treatment. Shit. Hmm. So in tonight's tale, we join Jeff Kramer, moving out to a rural Colorado town for a new job opportunity. Trouble is, the house he rents ain't exactly Ken and Barbie's dream home. So without further delay, I give you Outskirts of Meeker Valley. Jeff Kramer sat on the front porch, casually smoking a cigarette. He took a drag and leaned back in his metal chair, wondering if he had missed anything about Cannon City. Fifteen years, he thought to himself. They passed like the smoke that drifted gently into the night sky. Suddenly, the quiet moment was disrupted by his girlfriend, Mallory, who yelled from the kitchen. Jeff, can you take this trash out? His hand jerked, causing the ash from his cigarette to go flying. He took one last puff and flicked the butt into the driveway. I was just out front finishing a cigarette. The trash ain't going nowhere. Mallory smiled. Exactly. It ain't going nowhere unless you bring it to the barrel. Jeff had spent the day packing his belongings into a U-Haul trailer. He had accepted a promotion at a small outline in prison in Meeker, Colorado, and was leaving in the morning. Mallory was staying behind. Despite how things may have looked on the outside, Mallory had a hard time hiding her reservations. She felt that Jeff had once again chose work over her. Jeff grappled with trying to please her while at the same time fulfilling his dream to live in a small rural town. While lying in bed, Mallory turned to him. I hope you don't feel like I'm trying to hold you back or that I've become a burden to you. Uh, why would you think that? Jeff responded as he ran his fingers through her hair. Well, it's just a feeling that I get sometimes. Her eyes teared up. I know it's going to be tough at first, but as soon as you sell the house, you're going to move up there with me, right? Mallory sniffled and turned on her back. But it's not just that. I get another feeling, too. What? It's like an anxious feeling, like the timing is wrong. She sighed. It's hard to explain. Jeff smiled and gently kissed her on the cheek. It's just nerves. I'm sure it's no different than what I'm feeling, too. The next morning, Jeff finished uploading the last of his stuff into his trailer. After he latched the door, he paused and took one last look around the neighborhood. Mallory watched from the storm door. Her eyes were bloodshot from crying, which seemed to illuminate their blue color. He got into his truck and waved. 
I love you. I'll call you when I get up there. Mallory waved back as she gazed longingly through the window. While sitting in traffic, Jeff picked up a travel brochure that was sitting on his seat. The caption read, Meeker, Colorado. Experience the Old West. Hunting, fishing, hiking, and even a theatrical town square gunfight show complete with simulated public hanging. Small town charm with plenty of big city amenities. He grinned as he sat the brochure back down. He could almost hear the zing of his fishing pole line as it cut the water with the rainbow trout on the end of his hook. By late afternoon, Jeff had arrived at the house he would be renting. The property belonged to a man by the name of Alan Rich. He was also employed by the state and transferring to the same prison complex that Jeff had worked at. Jeff, who was filling Rich's position at Meeker Correctional Center, stumbled across the house when looking for rental properties. It was located just outside of Meeker, about 30 minutes from Rifle, Colorado. The two men discovered the coincidence when talking on the phone. Rich was a stiff-looking man with a large build and a military-style buzz cut. His eyes were beady, almost penetrating, and reminded Jeff of the rats you would sometimes see near the heater vents in the cell house. I've been waiting here since two o'clock. I take it traffic was bad, huh? Rich said sarcastically. Jeff smiled. Yeah, a little bit. There's a few more things I want to show you before I leave. Rich took Jeff to the edge of the stairs that led to the basement and then turned to him with a serious look on his face. This house was built by hand by my father, back when men built their own houses. You don't see this kind of craftsmanship anymore. Rich then reached up and turned on the light. It was the old pull chain top and was covered in a layer of dust. The stairs creaked under the stress of the men's weight. As they reached the bottom and turned the corner, Jeff expected to see a dusty, dingy space. Instead, he was surprised to see a fully finished basement, complete with a pool table and built-in wet bar. Jeff's eyes lit up. I missed this when I came through the first time. Rich smiled, then walked over to the bar and reached under the table. He pulled out two shot glasses and a bottle of Kentucky bourbon. You drink? Some, Jeff responded. Good, because I don't trust a man that doesn't. Rich poured two shots and pushed one towards Jeff. He raised his glass. Salut. Jeff toasted him and drank his shot. This was my dad's bar. When I was little, him and my mom would throw parties down here. You can have full access to it. The only thing I ask is if you finish a bottle, just replace it. Rich placed the shot glasses in the metal sink and then proceeded back upstairs. He took Jeff through the garage and into the backyard. The house sits on an acre. Now I know you're just renting the place, but I still expect the grass to get mowed and the weeds to be cut down. Any big projects like trees or shrubs, I'll handle. Jeff's eyes were drawn to an old wooden shed that sat at the edge of the property. Is the shed for storage? The shed's locked up. Rich said sternly. It's just a bunch of my dad's old junk sitting in it. As soon as I get the space, I'll get it cleaned out. Rich then turned to Jeff. So, you ready to sign the lease? Jeff smiled widely. Well, I gotta have somewhere to unpack my crap at. After he had signed all the paperwork, Rich pulled out two sets of keys and sat them on the table. If you have any problems, you have my number. All the utilities are paid through the end of the month. Rich then picked up his copy of the lease and placed it in a manila envelope. He shook Jeff's hand and as he walked out the door, muttered something under his breath. Jeff looked up, but Rich was already gone. After a few minutes, Jeff stepped out onto the back porch and thought a cigarette seemed fitting. He leaned against the iron railing and took a drag as he peered off into the distance. A voice softly whispered in his ear. Welcome home. He looked around startled, but no one was there. Slowly, he crept down the porch steps as his eyes panned the yard. He followed the fence line until he came upon the wooden shed that sat at the edge of the property. He looked up at it curiously. 
The paint was faded and flaking off, and an old master lock secured the two rickety doors. He stood there for a few moments until he finished his cigarette. I just know you're going to love this place, Jeff said to Mallory over the phone. Really? Yeah, it just has a charm to it, and you should see the downstairs. I don't know why there weren't more pics of it on the website. Was the landlord nice? Mallory asked. He was kind of uptight. We mainly just went over paperwork. Jeff left it at that. Well, I need to start unpacking before it gets too late. After he hung up, he tugged at his t-shirt to get some airflow. The ceiling fan in the living room squeaked as it struggled to keep up. Jeff walked over and flipped on the central air, then began unloading his trailer. That first night was restless. Jeff tossed and turned for what seemed like hours before finally falling asleep. Soon he began to dream. In the dream, he's chopping wood in the backyard. He hears a car horn and walks around to the front of his house, carrying his axe. It's Mallory's Toyota pickup. She hopped out of the cab and ran to him. I wanted to surprise you today, she exclaimed. Jeff stood there emotionless. She wrapped her arms around him and buried her head into his chest. His expression turned from a blank stare to a psychotic grin. You're so thoughtful. He raised his arms to hug her, resting the axe on her shoulder blade. In the next sequence, they're laying in bed together. Shadows dance to the rhythmic flicker of the candlelight. He slowly begins kissing her neck. She smiles and runs her hand down his back. Suddenly, he gets more aggressive, biting at her and restraining both of her wrists. As she begins to struggle and cry out, he looks up into the mirror that hung from the headboard. It's not his reflection that he sees, but riches. Shadows blacked out his eyes, and he grinned devilishly. At that moment, Jeff awoke. His chest was pounding and sweat beaded on his forehead. He sat up and turned to look into the mirror on his headboard. Thank God, he thought to himself, I'm still me. The next day, he spent getting the house in order. As night came, he sat in his recliner next to the lamp, studying facility regulations. His bifocals rested snugly on the tip of his nose as he flipped through the pages. A thought entered his mind. The shed. There was something special. Something that was meant just for him that was inside there. It seemed to come out of nowhere, but just as quickly as it crept into his mind, it was gone. He shifted his eyes back to his notebook and continued reading. It was the final week of Jeff's vacation before starting his new position. He was sitting on his back steps looking at his phone when he heard a voice holler from next door. Hey, neighbor! Jeff looked up, shielding his eyes from the sun. An older, white-haired man in suspenders casually strode towards him. The name's Glenn Spurlock. Jeff walked over and met him at the fence. I'm Jeff Kramer. I moved in about a week ago. I seen that. I didn't even know Alan was selling the place until I seen the sign. He grinned. Are you from around here? Cannon City. Really? My wife has some family out near Fremont County. They both stood there talking for some time, and Jeff soon found himself taking a liking to Glenn. Later that night, they sat out on Glenn's patio playing cards. Me and the wife were good friends with the riches, Glenn said, then paused to take a swig of his beer. We would get together almost every Friday night, he smiled thoughtfully. That all changed once Karen... Alan's mother got sick. Once Hank couldn't take care of her anymore, she went into a nursing home. Sometime later, I heard she passed away. Glenn got a serious expression on his face. I probably shouldn't be telling you all this. Jeff listened intently. What happened to her husband? Uh, Hank became a recluse after that. We would see him less and less until one day... We didn't see him at all. Did he also pass away? Glenn sighed. (sighs) 
He took his own life. Jeff grimaced. Really? My understanding was Alan came over one day to check on him and found his body inside the house. Jeff's eyes got big. He died? Inside the house that I'm renting? Listen, back in the old days, it wasn't uncommon for people to pass away inside their homes. They didn't have nursing homes or hospice like today. Dying of natural causes is one thing, but suicide? Glenn shrugged his shoulders. Alan and Jessica lived in there up until about six months ago when they split up. Jeff looked back at his house with buyer's remorse. After another poker hand, the men decided to call it a night. As Jeff turned to walk back home, Glenn motioned to him. Listen, out of respect for the family, don't go repeating what I told you. I just figured you'd find out sooner or later. Jeff nodded. By afternoon, the thermometer on the back porch registered 91. Jeff wiped the sweat from his brow and found himself holding his cordless drill, standing in front of the shed in his backyard. As he stood there, the same fleeting voice he heard on his porch whispered through the trees. Go ahead, open it. It's waiting for you inside. He lifted the drill and feverishly began unscrewing the hinge that was secured by a rusted out master lock. As the doors flung open, he found the inside was empty, except for a single object that was covered by a large tarp. Jeff grabbed his flashlight and stepped inside. Funny, he thought to himself. He remembered Rich saying that he didn't have room for all the stuff that was in there. He shined his light on the object and slowly peeled back the tarp. It was a chest made out of wood. It looked to be cedar. He smiled with the light and his eyes seemed to gleam as his flashlight beam reflected off them. He bent down and wiggled the handle, but it was locked. Carefully, he hoisted it onto a dolly that he got from the garage. As he wheeled it through the backyard, he looked around nervously, as if he expected Rich to pull up at any minute. There were no visible screws that fastened the lock to the chest, so Jeff tried his luck at picking it. After several attempts with no success, he finally heard a click. He undid both latches and the lid made a squeaking sound as it slowly opened. Inside was an antique record player and several stacks of records. Jeff grabbed one and blew off the dust. Robert Johnson, Crossroad Blues, the cover read. He sat it back down and picked up the record player, placing it on his workbench. He then slipped the record out of its sleeve and placed it on the turntable. Before he had a chance to wind the crank, the record began to spin. He backed away frantically, tripping over the chest and bumping his head on a shelf. As he lay on the ground dazed, he looked up at the record player. The needle slowly raised and moved itself onto the record. The old brass horn let out a hissing and popping noise before opening with a soulful guitar riff. Jeff began to panic as he desperately looked around the garage. Suddenly, the window next to his workbench blew out. He screamed and shielded his face from the shards of glass that landed on him. The music continued to play in the background unabated. Jeff! Jeff, are you okay? Jeff slowly opened his eyes. Glenn was hunched over him, slapping him in the face. As he helped him to his feet, he winced and rubbed the back of his head. Thanks. I tripped over this damn chest and lost my balance. I ran over when I heard your window shatter. What happened? Jeff looked over at the window and then looked down. I don't know. I don't exactly remember. The record was no longer playing and the needle rested back in its holder. Uh, well, here, let me give you a hand cleaning this mess up, Glenn said as he grabbed the broom. After the two got the mess cleaned up, Jeff boarded up the window. He glanced over at the record player which sat unassuming on top of his workbench. Still trying to make sense of what happened, he gathered his courage and cranked the handle several turns. Nothing happened. He cranked it again and backed away. Still, the turntable failed to spin. 
He looked it over and then decided to reenact the same sequence of events that led up to the strange phenomenon. He placed the record back in its sleeve, laid the record player in the chest, and then repeated the process. Still, the turntable didn't budge. With a puzzled look on his face, he placed the record player back in the trunk. The hinges shrieked as he closed the lid. Roll call began at 0545. Jeff sat near the front of the room where most of the new hires and transfers were ostracized to. He was now sporting a tight buzz cut, and absent were the gold-rimmed glasses that he had worn since he was a kid. Towards the back, where the light dimmed and the hum of the coke machine was deafening, sat Whispers and Sergeant Espinosa. Whispers' real name was Patrick Harper, but everyone called him Whispers because of an assault at the penitentiary that damaged his vocal cords. He elbowed Espinosa in the side. I take it that's the new lieutenant. Espinosa looked up. Yeah, he looks like an asshole. Just another limp dick like the last one. I wouldn't be surprised if Carlson brought him up here to spy on everyone. After he finished taking attendance, Captain Carlson motioned to Jeff as he spoke to the room. This is Lieutenant Kramer. He'll be the new shift commander on days. Jeff turned to everyone and waved. As they walked into the complex, Carlson pulled Jeff to the side. Listen, the crew up here is kind of an interesting bunch. A lot of these people have been here since Colorado was still a territory. He grinned and looked at Jeff thoughtfully. Some can come off as a little abrasive, but just give them a chance. CO Grigo looked up from checking Whisper's bag in the entranceway and saw Jeff talking with the captain in the parking lot. He handed him his bag back and squinted. Hey, Whispers, that's not Rich out there, is it? No, it's his replacement. I forget his name. Kramer! Sergeant Espinosa exclaimed. Yeah, that's it. Grigo couldn't help but notice the similarities between the two men. The shadow cast by the perimeter lights only added to it. He laughed. <laughs> Maybe it's just the G.I. Joe haircut. Jeff walked into the break room and up to a large office with a leather couch and a giant palm cactus. Is this my office? He asked Carlson, who followed behind him. No, that's my office. Yours is further down the hallway. Carlson led Jeff to a much smaller room next to the bathrooms. This is yours. It was originally a porter closet that was converted into an office. As soon as the new fiscal year comes around, we'll try to get you some different furniture in here. Carlson smiled. Well, I'll let you settle in. I'll be back for the noon count. Count time. Count time. The message came over the intercom and Jeff walked with the captain over to the control center. Espinosa stared at him and sipped on a glass of iced tea while he waited for the count sheets to come in. The porters cleaned while they waited for the count to clear. Inmate John Yellowhair was the office porter and also a trustee. A trustee was a prison term for inmates that had been down for many years and earned the respect and trust of staff. He spoke with whispers inside the unit office. How's the new lieutenant? Yellowhair asked. I don't know. He just got up here. He continued mopping and looking down towards the floor. Suddenly, he stopped and looked up at whispers with a serious look on his face. You know I'm not one to bullshit you, boss. Whispers nodded. In Native American culture, we are a very spiritual people. We believe that we all carry with us an aura. It is who we are. And like all people, some is good, some is bad, and some is in the middle. Yellowhair looked over his shoulder. When your lieutenant got up here and I took one look at him, I saw something that I've never seen before in my life. Whisper's eyes were fixed on Yellowhair. What did you see? His aura was dark, and uh, not his own. Whispers laughed and leaned back in his chair. What exactly have you guys been smoking out there in the sweat lodge? Yellowhair sighed. Listen, I know it sounds crazy, 
But a long time ago, my granddad told me a story of a man on that reservation that uh, opened himself up to negative energies. He said his aura was black and gray. It wasn't his own, but it tried to portray itself as if it was. He had the ability or sense to see into a man's soul. Whispers leaned up in his chair and a smile had drained from his face. So you're telling me that this new guy is possessed or something? I've had these visions since I was a boy. At first I didn't know what it was. It kind of frightened me. It wasn't until later that I learned I shared the same gift as my granddad. He sighed heavily. I don't know for sure if your lieutenant is possessed, but there's something that I've never seen before. Something ugly that is surrounding him. While turning in keys after work, Whispers turned to Sergeant Espinosa. Inmate Yellowhair thinks that the new lieutenant is possessed. Espinosa laughed. <laughs> what? Yeah, I know. I laughed at first, too. I don't know, does Kramer come off as a little strange to you? You know what, Whispers? That fucker stood in the corner almost the whole time while he was in the control center. The same way that Rich would. Hell, in the same spot. Espinosa crossed his arms. You gotta quit listening to inmates, though. Yellow hair is a drug addict and a thief that's been in and out of the system since Juvie. Several days had passed and Jeff was walking through Charlie Wing. He walked very slowly, carefully examining each cell. He finally stopped in front of Charlie 36. He looked inside the window and saw Yellow Hair laying down watching his television. Yard, come to C-36, he called out over the radio. Whispers showed up wearing his fingerless gloves and reaching for his cuffs. What's up, LT? I want you to strip this one out and shake his room down. And I don't mean pick up his trash and leave a mint on his pillow. I mean dump his shit into a little pile in the middle of the floor. Jeff walked away briskly. When Whispers looked in and saw it was yellow hair, he reluctantly opened his door. The lieutenant wants you stripped out and your room shook down. Yellow hair peeled off his headphones and turned to him. What's this concerning? I don't know. Whispers tried to be stern. But the LT wants it done, so get your shirt on and follow me to the restroom. After he was finished, Whispers knocked on Jeff's door. I stripped him and checked every inch of that cell for contraband. The only thing I found was some extra laundry ties and a few scrub pads. He paused as he peeled off his gloves. Well, what was that about? I got a snitch guy claiming that yellow hair might be bringing in drugs. Jeff turned to his computer and then turned back. Also, check the sweat lodge. They could be hiding it in their pile of shit out there. At lunch, yellow hair walked slowly through the chow line. Espinosa stood by the window monitoring the inmates. As Yellow Hair passed by, he nervously looked up from his tray. Hey, Sarge, after lunch, can I get a minute of your time? He met Yellow Hair in the hallway after he finished eating. Look, you know I'm not one to stir up shit. I keep to myself. I know how to do time. Espinosa stood with his arms crossed and nodded. I know why your lieutenant is bringing heat on me. The shakedowns, the strip outs. I know it isn't just a coincidence. So then what is it? Yellow hair clutched his medicine bag. Ever since I talked with Whispers the other day, Kramer's been on my ass. Esbenosa had an unconcerned look on his face. All I know is I'm almost out of here and I don't need anyone messing that up for me, okay? Jeff heard Mallory's truck pull into his driveway. Axel, her dog, jumped out and followed her up the porch steps. As Jeff opened the door, she hugged him and then pulled away to get a glimpse of his new look. Her smile slightly faded. What's wrong? You just look so... different. Where did all your hair go? And no glasses? Did you get contacts? Axel, who usually ran to Jeff, stood behind Mallory. 
The hair on the back of his neck stood up and he began to snarl and bark. Jeff looked at the dog. What's wrong with him? He then placed his hands on Mallory's shoulders. I don't know any good barber shops up here, so I decided to cut my own hair. One on the side and four on the top. He made a shearing motion with his hand. And my glasses started giving me headaches, so I ditched them. Well, you better get into an eye doctor. Can you see it all? I see fine. Jeff's tone became more agitated. Already bitching. Is that all you care about, my haircut or my glasses? No, Mallory said, startled. You look just a little different, but I'll get used to it. She grinned awkwardly. Jeff turned and walked inside. She made her way to the patio where she sat with her arms crossed. Jeff came up from behind her. Thirsty? She turned around quickly and saw Jeff hovering over her, holding a bottle of Bud Light. He twisted open the cap and handed it to her, then sat down next to her. So, what do you think? Mallory looked around thoughtfully. It's just wonderful. It looks like you had the mountains in your backyard. Sometimes in the early morning I can watch the deer grazing in this back area. He pointed out into the distance. It's amazing how tame they are. Mallory smiled contentedly. As soon as I get a chance, I'm going to get a bow. When the season rolls around, I won't even have to get out of my boxes to kill the little bastards. Mallory got a puzzled look on her face. That's funny. I didn't know you hunted. Jeff smiled and pulled out his red Zippo lighter from his shirt pocket. There's a lot of things I didn't know about me either until I got up here. He then lit his cigarette and took a puff. Later that day, Mallory rummaged through the cabinets looking for a colander when she came across a pile of old photographs. She wiped her hands on her apron and then curiously shuffled through them. They looked to be family photos of the people that used to live in the house. She suddenly stopped and the corners of her eyes crinkled like paper mache as she studied one that caught her attention. It was a man standing in the living room. He had a large build and was wearing a black tank top. His hair was shaved into a crew cut and he had a mustache that extended just past the corners of his mouth. In his hand was a bottle of Bud Light. She turned and looked outside. Jeff was standing next to the barbecue grill, wearing a black tank top and holding his can of beer. With him no longer wearing glasses and his hair buzzed, the resemblance was uncanny. She could see him getting ready to come inside, so she quickly tossed the photos back into the cabinet, but slipped the one she was looking at into her back pocket. Some weeks later, after returning to her home in Cannon City, Mallory sipped coffee and tried to keep her composure while visiting her friend Janet. Janet looked intensely at Mallory as she studied her body language. What's wrong, Mal? You seem distant lately. Mallory sighed, sat her coffee down, and crossed her arms. I don't know. Something's off with Jeff. How so? This might sound strange, but his looks and personality have changed. Jeff was the sweetest guy, but lately he's become the biggest asshole. And there was this picture that I found up in his cabinet. She pulled out the photo that she took from Jeff's house and placed it on the coffee table. I know it might sound crazy, but I found this photo in one of the cabinets. This man, I don't know who he is, but he looks just like Jeff looks now. Janet looked down at the photo, then picked it up and squinted to get a better look. She got a surprised look on her face. That's Lieutenant Rich. The new guy who transferred from Meeker. Mallory had a puzzled look on her face. Wait, that's the guy Jeff's renting the house from? Later that evening, Mallory gathered up the courage to call Jeff. So what's the guy's name that you're renting the house from? Alan Rich. The guy who transferred to Cannon City, right? Do you know why he left Meeker? Yes. From what he told me, I think he was taking care of his father until he died. Or should I say blew his brains out in the bathroom? What? The old man next door told me. His father killed himself in here. I guess Rich must have forgotten to mention that to me when he was telling me about this place's colorful history. I will say the crime scene cleanup crew did a pretty good job of cleaning up the mess. 
Of course, even the best tidying up can't always catch those stray remnants of skull matter that sometimes get left behind. Jeff smiled sadistically. Mallory's stomach turned as she began to realize that this wasn't Jeff on the other end of the phone. It may have sounded like his voice, but she knew this wasn't something that he would ever say to her in his right state of mind. Inmate Yellowhair decided the best policy would be to lay low and avoid Jeff at any cost, and the next few weeks at Meeker Correctional Center were pretty quiet. Jeff mainly kept to himself, and most of the staff just assumed he was a little odd. Sergeant Espinosa knocked on the window out of the control center and motioned to Whispers to come inside in a dramatic fashion. Check this out! He pointed at the new tool inventory sheet that hung on the wall next to all the equipment. Look how Kramer signed it! Whispers glanced at the sheet and saw the signature was signed, A. Rich. Is this the new sheet or the old one? Espinosa pointed at the date in the upper corner. It's the one that just came out this week. Why would he sign his name as A. Rich? Whispers said in his raspy voice. Espinosa just raised his eyebrow. Can I force him to get mental health treatment if he doesn't want to? Mallory asked Janet over the phone. So you think he went up there and lost his mind? Janet responded. How else do you explain someone's personality and looks completely changing? Is he drinking? Yeah, Bud Light. I've known the man for the last five years and he hates Bud Light until now. Janet snickered. Woman, if changing your favorite alcoholic beverage qualifies you for mental illness, I think I'd be certifiable at this point. I'm being serious, Janet. Listen, I went through a similar situation with Ron. He became distant, started keeping secrets, all that. As long as he hasn't cheated on you like Ron did to me, all the rest of that stuff can be worked out. And sometimes people just change. Janet sighed. Hell. Maybe it's a midlife crisis or a male menopause. We get hot flashes and they take up bow hunting. Mallory sighed, overcome with emotion. Yeah, maybe so. Captain Carlson leaned into Jeff's office. Hey, Kramer, I have to ask you about something. I was checking the tool inventories and couldn't help but notice the signature on the pages. Carlson placed the papers on Jeff's desk. Jeff looked down at it. Carlson smirked. It's signed A. Rich. Lieutenant Rich left here a few months back. There's no way he was here to sign these. There was an uncomfortable silence between the two men and Carlson chewed his gum nervously. Jeff had no expression on his face. I didn't sign those. Well, who did? Rich must have signed them before he left. Carlson stopped smiling and closed the door behind him. Also, a couple staff have told me that you've identified yourself as Rich when you've answered your phone. Jeff shrugged his shoulders. Well, are they just making it up? Carlson asked sternly. I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Those inventories are legal documents. Jeff interrupted. There's been a lot of accusations and finger pointing going on since I got here. And not just with me. Carlson got a serious look on his face. What do you mean? Jeff smiled. Inmates tell me things. I know what's going on with you and that housekeeping sergeant. Taking her in the porter closet during count when you think no one notices. How long's that been going on? Does your wife know? Carlson scowled and pointed at Jeff. You don't know shit. Don't you ever bring my wife into this, got that? Jeff leaned back in his chair and put his hands behind his head. Cap, you don't know who you're dealing with. I didn't come here to make friends. He leaned back up slowly, and his eyes got real big. You ain't gonna run me off again. The sweat beaded on Carlson's forehead. You're right. I don't know you. But we're going to get to know each other real quick. You think you can just transfer here, threaten me, and take over my prison? This ain't Cannon City. You have no idea how things work up here. Yeah? Carlson turned to leave, then turned back to Jeff. We'll deal with this later. 
Mallory had been agonizing about how to approach Jeff over her concern for him. She decided to take a trip to see him with his brother Mark. I haven't spoken to Jeff in months, Mark said as he sat in the passenger seat of her pickup. You really haven't missed much. It's like talking to a stranger. Her hands nervously clutched the steering wheel. Mark looked out the window gloomily as the pine trees that lined the road rushed by. Jeff was chopping wood beside the house when they pulled up. Jeff! Mallory cried out. He continued splitting the logs as if he didn't hear her. Jeff! She yelled again. Jeff! Mark yelled as he walked closer to him. Jeff paused and turned around. Mallory ran up to give him a hug. The axe rested against her shoulder blade, just like in the nightmare Jeff had. What are you doing here? Jeff asked. Mallory swallowed heavily. Well, me and your brother just wanted to come check on you. We were concerned that we haven't heard from you in a while. Jeff walked up to the porch and sat down in his chair. He pulled a bandana from his pocket and swatted the mosquitoes. Mallory and Mark both sat next to him. I would have called more, but I've just been really busy up here with the new house and job. I can see that. What is it about this place? Mark asked. Jeff paused and looked up at the sky thoughtfully. Some people find places, and some places find people. This place found me. Mallory looked over at Mark with despair. Her eyes teared up and she had an emotional outburst. I don't know if you're trying to make me feel unwelcomed or if you're just so damn caught up in yourself that you could care less about your family. Mark squirmed. It's been a long drive. Mind if I use your bathroom? First door on the left. Mark opened the screen door and made his way through the living room. There were two pictures hanging on the wall that caught his attention. Strangely, he didn't recognize any of the people. Jeff came up quietly from behind, startling Mark. She was beautiful, wasn't she? Jeff pointed to the picture of an older lady smiling next to who appeared to be her husband. Who is she? These are pictures of my family. Mark looked confused. Your family? This isn't our parents. What are you talking about, Jeff? She passed away on a Tuesday afternoon, Jeff sobbed. Some months later, Dad passed too. Blew his brains all over the bathroom wall. The same bathroom I showered in and brushed my teeth in since I was a kid. Jeff grew more and more frantic. <laughs> Do you know what that's like? Do you know what that does to a person to find his own father like that? Jeff, Mark pleaded. Get out. What? Get out of my house. Mark tried to rationalize with Jeff, but before he could say anything, Jeff began to strangle him. <sighs> Mallory burst into the house. What the hell are you doing? Jeff turned to her, tipping over the lamp and end table. His green eyes had turned an unholy black. Mark grabbed Mallory and the two ran out of the house, got into her pickup and sped off. That's not my brother, Mark said, still out of breath. When I looked into his eyes, they were black. Did you see that? Mallory nodded in disbelief. The two stayed silent most of the way home. Alan Rich grumbled to himself as he checked his calendar. It had been over two months since he received any rent money from Jeff and property taxes for the house were coming due. He dialed his number, but like all the times before, it went straight to his voicemail. Rich decided to pay Jeff a visit and pulled up in his driveway in his Ford King Ranch. He put it in park, took off his sunglasses and looked around the property. The yard was well manicured, he knocked on the door and stood back and crossed his arms. The door slowly opened and Jeff answered. Can I help you? Yeah, you can help me. You're two months late on your rent and you don't answer your phone. I had to drive all the way up here, Rich barked. Excuse me? Jeff replied. Rich raised his voice. Sorry if I was unclear. Let me rephrase that. You're two months late on your rent. I need the money. Just who in the hell do you think you are? Rich rolled his eyes. Listen, asshole, I'm the landlord. Just who in the hell do you think you are? I'm Alan Rich. I own this property. Rich's eyes got real big. 
Are you fucking with me? Are you crazy or something? Jeff reached behind the door and pulled out his crossbow. He pointed it at Rich and pulled the trigger. The arrow struck him in his trachea. He stumbled back, trying to keep his balance as he inched closer to the edge of the porch. He took his hands and grabbed the arrow, pulling it out only a few inches before tripping backwards down the steps. Rich laid there, gasping for air, with the arrow sticking out of his neck. A pool of blood began to form on the sidewalk under his body as the life slowly drained from his eyes. Glenn Spurlock was watering some plants in his yard when he heard the commotion. He dropped the hose and adjusted his glasses as he looked through the slats in the fence. Good God almighty, he said to himself. He ran inside his house almost tripping over his own feet and called the police. Jeff calmly put the crossbow down and walked out to where Rich laid. He grabbed his feet and drug his body up the steps and into the house. A short time later, a patrol car sped into the driveway. There was a smeared blood trail on the sidewalk that led into the house. A look of concern came over Deputy Arnold's face. Get your double barrel ready, Sheriff Houston said to him. Dispatch, this is Yukon 1. Get all available units to 1127 Golden Oak, possible Code 9. The two exited their squad car with their weapons drawn and ran up to the front of the house. Houston motioned to Arnold to go around back. He then proceeded cautiously to the front door. He knocked and announced himself. This is Meeker County Sheriff's Department. I need you to discard any weapons that you may have and peacefully exit the house with your hands up. Arnold led himself through the back gate, gripping his shotgun so tight his fingers began to cramp. He looked in the living room window and saw Rich's body on the floor, with the arrow still in his neck. He slammed his back up against the house and took a deep breath. Yukon 1. This is Yukon 4. I got a visual on a wounded male victim inside the house. Possibly deceased. Roger that, Houston responded. He raised his voice and announced himself again. I repeat, this is the Meeker County Sheriff's Department. I need you to discard any weapons that you may have and peacefully exit the residence with your hands up. If you fail to do so, we will be forced to come in and get you. Arnold turned to look back in the window. Suddenly he froze. He could hear the faint sound of music coming from inside the house. Houston came around the side and startled him. Arnold jumped and stumbled backwards. Jesus, man, you scared the crap out of me. No one's opening up. I think we can gain access through the window on the east side of the house. Listen, Arnold exclaimed. You hear that music? Houston looked inside the window and saw Rich's body. He then put his ear to the glass and listened. There could be someone inside, or it could be a diversion. He motioned to Arnold to follow him to the side of the house. Houston took his baton out of his holster and broke out the window. He dragged it around the edges, carefully clearing away the jagged bits of glass. He then climbed through while Arnold followed close behind. Houston's eyes scanned the inside of the house. It was in disarray, like it had been ransacked by a madman. Both men kept their weapons drawn. Houston pointed to the living room. They walked over to Rich's blood-soaked body. Arnold kicked his side, then knelt down and checked his pulse. He looked up at Houston. He's dead. They continued walking into the pantry that led into the garage. The music got louder. As they got to the door, Houston turned to Arnold and nodded. Arnold raised his shotgun. Houston crouched down and aimed his pistol, then swung open the door. Inside the garage, Jeff sat alone with his back to the two men. He stared motionless at the record player as it belted out the old blues song. Show me your hands, Houston shouted. Jeff sat unresponsive with his hands in his lap. Show us your damn hands, Arnold hollered over the music. The two men couldn't see that Jeff's eyes were blacked out. They slowly walked down the steps, keeping their aim. Houston sensed something wasn't right. He quietly whispered under his breath, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He carefully holstered his pistol and grabbed his taser. 
This is your last chance to put your hands in the air and end this peacefully. After a few moments, Houston pulled the trigger and hit Jeff in the back of his neck with his taser. Jeff scowled menacingly and got up out of his chair, ripping the probes out of his neck. Houston got a surprised look on his face and fumbled for his pistol. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Arnold strike Jeff in the head with the buttstock of his shotgun. Jeff fell to the garage floor. Houston drove his knee in the small of his back and cuffed him from behind. The record player stopped spinning, causing the music to slow to a drawn-out stop. Dispatch, this is Yukon 1. I got one in custody. Outside, a barrage of police vehicles lined the street. Houston smirked at Arnold. Perfect timing. He placed Jeff in the back of his squad car and closed the door. He turned to Arnold. Did you happen to get a good look at this asshole's face when he turned around? Arnold thought about it for a minute. Not really, but my 12 iron sure did. He chuckled obnoxiously. Houston looked down at the ground and rubbed his face. I think I've been doing this line of work way too long, kid. Because I swear to you, that man had no eyes when he looked at me. Arnold's smile disappeared. What do you mean he had no eyes? He looked at Jeff in the squad car. Hey, looks like he has a set of eyeballs to me. Listen, don't say anything. If that gets up to headquarters, I'll be filing paperwork behind some desk somewhere. Down at the Meeker County Detention Center, Jeff sat alone in his cell under observation. A psychiatrist assigned to his case spoke with Sheriff Houston in his office. Well, in layman's terms, I don't believe that he's faking it. He believes in his mind that he's this man Alan Rich that he murdered. When I asked him about Jeff Kramer, he appears confused. I see, Houston replied, crossing his arms. It's a severe case of a delusional disorder. Sir, does your profession... He cleared his throat nervously. <clears throat> uh, recognize demonic possession? Are you asking me personally or professionally? Layman's terms, Houston said. The psychiatrist smiled warmly. Sheriff, I'm a Catholic, but I'm not clergy. You'd have to get a hold of the church to get an answer on that matter. Deputy Wallace was making rounds in the jail that evening when Jeff called out to him. Deputy. Excuse me, deputy. Yeah, Wallace answered. Would it be possible to get a little music in here? It's so quiet. Wallace thought about it for a minute and looked over at his office radio, which was next to Jeff's cell. That might be a possibility. You've been fairly well behaved. Maybe some blues? Jeff smiled devilishly. <laughs> You've been listening to The Outskirts of Meeker Valley by author Brian Asbury. A reminder to consider things carefully when you reach your own crossroads. Some places you find, other places find you. And if you go messing around in my shed, I'll find your ass myself. <laughs> A little about the author. Brian Asbury is from Pueblo, Colorado. Many of the stories that he writes are just demented versions of people that he's either known or had encounters with over the years. When he was growing up, he was heavily inspired by Stephen King, The Twilight Zone, and Tales from the Crypt, and looks to bring back good storytelling and horror again. You can catch his story, The Chair in the Closet, on Scary Stories Told in the Dark, and White Coat Syndrome on Drew Blood's Dark Tales. He'll also be publishing a short story collection in the future, and the movie adaptation of one of his works is always a possibility. He wants to thank his lovely girlfriend Amber and all his friends and family. You know who you are. And while you're at it, please remember to stop by our Apple Podcast page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and subscribe. The charts are based on subscriptions, not listens, by the way. 
So feel free to accidentally subscribe as many times as you want. I won't tell anyone, I promise. And if you feel like spreading the word and helping old Drew Blood out and convincing a friend or two to subscribe to my podcast, that would help me out greatly, and I'd really appreciate it. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other podcast episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com where you can become a patron for as little as $5 a month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program and all our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there where you'll get all our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook and Instagram and sometimes Twitter. Sometimes. And remember, we're accepting submissions. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on this show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, friend. At least till next week. So grab a drink for the road. And here, take these fortune cookies with you. Who eats these fucking things? I'd like to say hi to some of our friends from YouTube. MDS Bach. Melissa J. 481. And Chris Carter. It's listeners like you who keep me going. Thank you. So without further ado, MDS Ba, Melissa J. 481, and Chris Carter. May the wind be at your back, and may the road rise up to meet you. Be the author of your own good fortune, and go fuck yourselves. <laughs> good to be back, y'all. See you next week. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.